Das ist hier da drauf, das ist der nächste so, schon dabei. Nach einer coolen, nun ein anderer großer Name, Hakom Lee. Äh, ein großer Name im Bereich der offenen Standards. MIT-Absolvent, sehr viele Jahre für das World Wide Web Consortium tätig im Bereich offene Standards und nun seit 2009 Chief Technology Officer bei Opera Software. Great that you could make it. Uh, und wir sind gespannt. Der Vortrag wird auf Englisch gehalten. Wenn Sie den Dolmetscherdienst in Anspruch nehmen wollen, können Sie sich noch einen Kopfhörer da hinten holen. Das scheint im Augenblick nicht erforderlich zu sein. Please, how come start? Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, they have these, these smart headphones if you'd like some translation. I believe most of you understand English, so you uh, may be able to follow. Um, if you do, uh, you are able to laugh in the right places, hopefully, and not 15 seconds later. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm always uh, happy to come to, uh, to, to Germany and especially Berlin. Ich würde gerne diese Auftrage uh, auf Deutsch halten, aber kein Vokabular, kein Grammatik. So I'll, I'll finish, I'll, I'll, I'll continue in English. But, but, um, As you said, as you, I, I'm, the, I'm the chief technology officer for Opera Software uh, in, in, in Oslo. And it's a delight for me to come to Berlin because Berlin is a great city for opera. I mean, you have three opera houses. <laughs> in, Nor in Norway, in Oslo, we only have one. This is a picture of the uh, Oslo um, Opera House. It's, it's um, quite new, actually, and you should, you should pay us a visit, visit as well. Um, The, 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 the roof there is quite fantastic, especially, uh, uh, especially in the winter, as you can see. Or I actually think this was, was in, the, in the spring. We had a, we had a, we had a visitor when, when, um, when we opened the opera house. Merkel, Angela Merkel was there, and, and she was quite impressive. Um, and, and I happen to like opera a lot myself. And, and I travel to, to this place uh, every year in Bayreuth. I'm sure many of you know this place. And I happen to sit, I had to tell you a little story. Uh, my, this is my Merkel story. I happen to sit uh, uh, on the row in front of Angela Merkel uh, for, for the ring cycle uh, two years back. And you know, Wagner's ring, it's a giant piece of work, the pinnacle of Western civilization. It's 20 hours in the, in, in the opera seat. And the, the seats in Bayreuth are very hard. Wagner didn't want any of us to fall asleep. So she, we, I was sitting there, and she was sitting there, and she quite enjoyed it. I was quite impressed. But I was not very impressed by her security guards. I mean, she had three guys with her, right, with, with, with these, kind of, these kind of intercom stuff, and they were, they were uh, placed on the, on, the, on, the, on the side of the hall. Um, but, you know, there were several murders on stage, and they didn't do anything. Okay, so back to Opera, as in Opera Software in Oslo. Uh, we make browsers. That's the only thing we do. Uh, we make browsers for all sorts of devices. Uh, I'm using Opera here to run my presentation. Uh, I can press, uh, I, this is a normal HTML file, and I press the magic button, and it turns into a presentation, uh, 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 and I'm thereby reusing the HTML uh, document. We also run Opera on mobile phones. Um, do you know of Opera Mini? Do any of you have Opera Mini installed? Some of you do, yes, very good. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Opera Mini later. Um, and also we, have, we build Opera into all sorts of devices like uh, uh, televisions and, uh, and game game, games consoles. Okay. So, uh, as a special offer for you today, we can, we, can, uh, we can offer you free browsers from this uh, website. You just go there and you can download it free today. Uh, Opera Mini. Um, Opera Mini, I think Opera Mini is one of the more, most meaningful things we do at Opera. Uh, by the, the, the basic concept is that we allow all phones, almost all phones, to get access to the web. What we do is that we compress web pages in the fixed network, in a server farm, um, and we send that compressed version of the web page over to the, to the phone. Uh, 
So when the user clicks on a link, the URL is transmitted to our servers. We fetch that web page. We compress that web page, typically by a factor of 10. And then we send that compressed web page back to the, to the phone. And that, that's good for the user because he or she saves time and saves money because there's less data to transmit. But it's also good for the operator because there's less data to transmit and they can get more customers into the same bandwidth. The bandwidth is limited. It's a natural spectrum. And by, by compressing the data, they can put more customers in there. So we have very many users of, of, of this te technology. Um, we had, at the beginning, we had a funny incident that happened uh, uh, in 2009 in, in Chicago when the Chicago Tribune, a newspaper, suddenly discovered that um, in the logs from the bus company in Chicago, uh, they found that Norwegians represented most of the visitors. So they asked themselves, you know, is Norway so boring in the winter that... Everything, all they had to do is, is look at, you know, the real-time map of buses in Chicago. What they didn't figure out was that actually this was the, due to Opera Mini. Because the, the users here, the users here, they were not in Norway at all. They, they were standing freezing in Chicago with their mobile phone, waiting for the bus. But they were using Opera Mini. And, but because we, at that point we had servers only in Norway... Their, their requests went through Norway. So in the, in the, in the logs, uh, they were seen as being uh, in Norway. That's now changed. We now have servers in many places uh, on the planet. And I'm going to show you some, some, um, some statistics. Um, we publish a report uh, once a month about the state of the mobile web. We recently had the incidents in Libya... And since this goes through our servers, we can see where, where, where things happen, uh, when it happens. And in Libya, it was very clear that they turned off the Internet. First, at the end of February, and then they came back a little bit, and then there has been a blank, blank period. L Libya has basically been off the map, but they're now back in again. So we can add, now add Libya to the number of uh, pages transformed through Opera Mini. We have now around 75 billion pages per month. And that's a stunning number. There's, we're 7, million, 7 billion people on this planet, and there are 75 billion pages per month being, being transcoded. So, of course, they're not evenly distributed. Some users are more eager than others. But we have reached a, a, a huge number of people. Um, there's more people using Opera than drives a Toyota. But they're not in the same places. If we look at the top 10 countries for July, we find that Russia is number one. We have Indonesia as number two. And Indonesia, that's not a country you think of when you think about the internet, perhaps. India. Anyone guesses this one? <laughs> Nigeria. Yeah. Ukraine, come on, anyone? Vietnam. Vietnam, good. Mexico, okay, I gave you a hint there. South Africa, China, and Brazil. So these are big countries, but they're not necessarily the richest or the most developed countries. So often what we have is that users in these countries, they don't have a PC. Many of them may not even have the power to run the PC, but they do have mobile phones. And by using Opera Mini, we can give them access to the web and all the information there is there. And one thing that I'm very happy to see when we look at the statistics of where these people go is that Wikipedia is almost always in the top 10 list in all these countries. Other than Wikipedia, there's a lot of stuff, sites, social sites that are used by, by, by people on desktop computers as well. So another conclusion we have is that there really is only one web. There isn't the mobile web and the, and, and, and the desktop web. There's only one web, and we use the, the, the same sites uh, in all these places. In, the few, in, in another report that we published, we could see, for example, how the Internet use uh, developed in Japan when they had um, the, the, the crisis there with the tsunami. And we saw that, for example, on the day that the, 
the earthquake uh, uh, strikes, Twitter is up. Then people want to use their social sites. And the next day, the news sites climbs on the statistics. And I'm not trying to trivialize this. I mean, we're talking about uh, catastrophes, which has enormous human cost. But I do think it's important to see what kind of tools these people have in a, in a situation of crisis and how we can improve these tools. Uh, I do think that technology matters and, and can improve the world. Now I'm going to go to... Not, this is not our server room. This is CERN. This is where the web was invented. This is uh, the world's biggest machine. Um, this is a detector which is buried underground between Switzerland and France. And, and the, the, the magnitude of this can be seen by, by the man standing here. Um, now, this detector detects very small particles that, that collide. And what, CERN, what the CERN physicists try to do is to see what matter is, is composed of when they have these collisions. But out of those collisions comes a lot of data. And that's why CERN has a, a, a huge computer division as well. They have um, enormous rooms with, with, with computers to process all this information. And they have lots and lots of researchers to do that. And they therefore have a huge computer department. And it was therefore here that the web was invented as a way for researchers foremost to start uh, to, to communicate better uh, than they used to. This is a picture that I took when I came there in 1994. This is the first internet, um, first web terminal, uh, public web terminal which was sitting there next to some pipes. I don't know what's in the pipes, but I know a little bit about what's in the, the computer there. Um, and this is kind of the, the marketing that was done for this, for this uh, terminal. You click, we do the rest. That was the slogan. And I think we can conclude now that the web, it didn't become what it is due to marketing. Um, <laughs> it's really... It's really, again, technology that made the difference, I think. And also the fact that Tim Berners-Lee didn't patent this. He let it out and let everyone use it, including the source code that he had written. Here's a picture of Tim. Um, I have a little story about Tim as well. Because when I came there in 1994, we had a little project going in Norway. We wanted to publish the, the laws of Norway on the internet. You, Already at that time, you could get access to the laws of Norway in electronic form, but you had to pay for it. There was a subscription, like $100 per month, and this was mostly for lawyers who wanted this for, for professional reasons. And for them, of course, that was uh, very inexpensive. It's very convenient for them to pay that price. But we thought that everyone should have access to the laws because we paid the politicians to create those laws. So we started a, pro uh, a project to type in laws, to scan laws, to get them into electronic form so that we could publish them. And there was a question of, is this legal or not? It was quite clear that the laws themselves were not copyrighted. That's the copyright law of Norway states that laws are exempt. But the notes in the law, for example, where, you, where it says, also see law of this and this date some other place, um, or replaced by this and this law, those notes, somebody claimed, were copyrighted. So it was a little unclear whether we were doing something uh, illegal or not. So since I was sitting in the neutral Switzerland, I was given the, the job of publishing these, all these, these law. So I did it little, a little sort of undercover, um, uh, although this soon came out and we had, we had an article in the Norwegian press about this. You know, you could get, get laws uh, now available for free. This is in Norwegian. I'm not going to uh, have you read that. But here's the English translation where they talked about an anarchistic group of 20 volunteers tries to replace Lovdata. The group is publishing the laws of Norway from a computer in Switzerland. From there, the laws are freely available via the world's largest computer network. The internet. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how anarchistic we were, really. I mean, we were publishing the laws, you know. 
<laughs> but at least, you know, we, we were able to force Love Data, the, the professional guys, to open up their laws after a year or so. So, as such, the project was successful. But what I was really going to tell you was uh, what happened one night, uh, one afternoon when I was working on this. I was sitting on the computer on the left there. And Tim, we, I was sharing office with Tim. He was say, sitting on his next station, the one in the middle there. So in order to get to his computer, he had to pass me. So one, one afternoon when I was you know, putting out these laws, legally or not, he, he stopped by and said, Håkon, what are you doing? And you know, he's my manager. And I said, you know, <clears throat> I'm uh, publishing the laws of Norway on CERN's computers so that the world can see them. And he said, do you need more disk space? <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good answer. Because the people who have invent these technologies, the people who did the internet in the first place, who did the web and who are working on standards, uh, 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 are very conscious about how to use those technologies still. And they do it for a reason. Many of them, at least. Maybe not all. But many of them are very conscious of, 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 of the, the fact that these things should be used for the better uh, of humanity. And since then, a lot of things have happened. Uh, we now have governments publishing data. They're much more uh, conscious about it. Uh, I think all countries now have an initiative, or most countries, at least in the West, have an initiative to push out data. Even UN, which sits on a lot of data, are, are, have uh, uh, efforts, coordinated efforts uh, in place, which is, which is very good. Because the same... Rule applies, I think, uh, that it did in '94. We've already paid for this information, so we should demand that it, it is available. It's also a good democratic principle that information should be, should be uh, uh, available. And I also think it can create businesses. For example, if the map data that the governments have is published, then we can create more businesses because you know, they can put a map on their sites, how to find the place, etc., etc. There are thousands of such projects on how new businesses have come up based on um, public information. There are also two reasons not to publish data. One is privacy, and, and another one is national security. But those are the only two reasons that I can find. I haven't found any other reasons not to publish uh, open data. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. Um, the, the, the technology that I started developing when I came to CERN in 94 is called CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. And it's a way of uh, making sure that websites look pretty. And we have continued the development of CSS uh, since the early days. Uh, you know, the web came out of CERN, which is a place for scientists. They don't care so much about aesthetics. Uh, they care about structure and information, but aesthetics was something that the people that came from desktop publishing wanted. They wanted colors and fonts and, 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 and such. And for a while, it looked like the internet would turn into a giant fax machine because people started making pictures of their text. Because they say, I want to use this font and this color, and if you can't give it to me, I'm going to take a picture of that, and I'm going to publish that picture on the web which is just you know, like what fax machines are doing. And that would have been terrible, because then you couldn't search in the text. It's much harder, if not impossible, to search in the text if it's buried inside an image somewhere. So we tried to make sure that authors could get the typographic, the aesthetics tools that they, that they needed in order to publish information. So CSS was developed, and it allows you to set all sorts of uh, aesthetic properties on text. And the whole, whole purpose, really, is to, to, to avoid using pictures uh, on the web. So, for example, this one, which could have been done in Photoshop and published as an image, is still text. And I'm, as I told you, I'm using Opera to, to, to give this uh, presentation. So this is, this is uh, running in a common web browser. And most web browsers are able to support these uh, new standards yet. Um, here's another feature. I mean, most of you are not web designers, so it's probably not so important to you. But web designers have been screaming for these features. They want rounded borders. And again, the threat is, if you don't give us rounded borders, we're going to take a picture of a rounded border and publish it. 
And I was, yeah, I was against this from the beginning. I said, you know, who in their right mind would use rounded borders? That's something we did in the 70s. You know, we have developed past that stage now. But the screaming has been too loud, and I've given in, and I said, we're going to do rounded borders. You want it? You know, we're going to do it. So now we have rounded borders. And, you know, by changing the, the, the line at the top there shows how to, to achieve these effects. So by just changing one parameter here in the code, we can have a different radius in the vertical and horizontal side. So you can have these, you know, visual effects. And this is all fluff. You know, it's not important. It's not important for Google. It's not important for the content. But it is important for the human reader, I think. We are aesthetic beings. And we need to make sure that the web can give us that visual experience in addition to all the content. So I think we need to combine these things. And that's what the technology is trying to do. And another thing is that this compresses much, more, much better than images do. Images take up a lot of space, whereas this technology is very compact, very compressed. So when we send it over to the phones in Malaysia, there's much less data to transmit. Another, another example of uh, technology that's, that's being developed and is being used now is, is uh, fonts, web fonts. Um, up to now, uh, Microsoft's fonts have been available on almost all computers, including Linux and Mac computers. Microsoft donated these, these fonts to the web, which is probably one of the best things Microsoft ever did. Um, but we've been using these fonts for, for a long time, and probably still most of the text you read on your computer screen is using one of these fonts. And some of us thought, it's now time to change that. We want more fonts. We want more variety. Um, so a, a, a technology has been developed, and by now all browsers support this, whereby you can add two lines of code. You see it up here. It looks perhaps a little cryptic if you don't know CSS, but it's really just you know, a line that you can copy. And then you suddenly have this fantastic angel font, which is done by a German typographer, uh, uh, Stefan Dieter Stefan is his name, and he's done many of these fonts. And they're, you know, you don't want to use these fonts. You don't want to use broadcast titling on your CV, for example. You don't want to read a whole newspaper uh, in, in in this font. But you know, for decoration, for birthday invitations, for 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 aesthetics, again, it's it's important, and it compresses well. And even if the font isn't available, even if the browser uh, is on a mobile phone and says, you know, I'm not going to bother downloading font, I, I can't afford it, then we still have the text there. I can still select the text. And that's really, really the most important thing. Um, my time is limited. I just wanted to give you a, f a few examples of the technology that's, that's happening. Another thing that's happening is HTML5. That's sort of the cousin to, to CSS. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of talk about apps uh, uh, in, in the past few years, where Apple and, and Google, through their iPads and iPhones and Android devices, have made apps available on phones and, and, and tablets, and people are buying these apps. And, you know, I think it's fantastic. It's a great user experience, many of these things. And basically, they get data from the web and present them. Um, but I also think it's very important that when we develop new things, that these things are done in open standards. And neither the Apple way or the Google way is, is open. There you tie yourself to one, one vendor. So I'd like for us to be able to develop the apps we need using HTML and CSS and JavaScript and other web standards. And I'll give you a small, um, a small demo of what's possible. And I hope this is going to work. This is a live demo. I'm going to show you what is becoming available in, in HTML5 with the geolocation, which is only one of a set of technologies that are coming in. So geolocation is able to provide the, 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 the place where the user is at the moment. So the page can ask the user, where are you now? So that it can you know, transform itself to something perhaps more useful. But that's privacy. Uh, we don't want that information to be given freely to every page. So uh, the browser here, Opera, asks the user, do you, want, do you want to tell the page where you are currently? 
And I'm going to do that. I'm going to share my location. So I'm going to click there. And it found me. That's right, isn't it? Schumannstrasse. How did it do that? This is a 60-year-old computer. It doesn't have GPS. It's really, it's really smart. What it does, it, it, it looks for other Wi-Fi networks in the area and, and finds the name of those Wi-Fi networks. Then Opera sends those names to a server somewhere, and that server knows that in, 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 in Schumannstrasse we find those networks. And then it comes back and gives us a location. So using this technology and a bunch of other technologies, we can build, we can build web, uh, apps in HTML uh, in the future. My last point is about books. I think books are important. And um, in Germany, you've been lucky enough to have a very active Wikipedia uh, community, and some of them are here in the audience. And this fantastic book was, was published a few years ago, and sometimes I bring it with me uh, when I give presentations, but it was a little too heavy. Uh, although it's only one band, it's a very heavy band, because there's a lot of articles in, in German Wikipedia, although only you know, a very small percentage of the article and a very small percentage of, 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 of the text was put into this one. Um, it, it still becomes a very heavy book. Um, now, I think... This marks a shift, because in the beginning, when we started out with the web thing, we took the laws of Norway and we typed them in and scanned them in. We took paper and put them onto the web. And this one's going the other way. The, the tide is shifting. Now we take information, and we want, when we want them in the web, we print them out from the web. I think as such, it's very important that the standards we use are able to do books right. And this is a sample page that shows some of the differences between a web page and a printed page. On, the, on, the, on a printed page, you, it's much more complex. You have footnotes, you have a, a table of contents, you have multi-column layouts, you have page numbers, you have many things that are not uh, used on a normal uh, common web page. But we must be, must be sure that the web technologies also can be used for printing, uh, I believe. And one, another very famous German book, um, you know what this is? Many of you do, I'm sure. Gutenberg's Bible, 1453. Um, it's a fantastically beautiful book. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, or maybe I'm not sorry yet, maybe sorry isn't the word, but I had to admit at least that we cannot do this book in HTML and CSS yet. Because if you look at, at the hyphens that Gutenberg used, this is very detailed. You see the small hyphens? He put them outside the lines. In order to get very straight right margins here, he put the hyphens that were very light on, on the outside. And that's not normal in today's typography. Today we would, we would put them inside. And that's what CSS can do. So we need that little flip to say hyphens go outside. But I can assure you that we're going to put that in because we want to do Gutenberg's Bible uh, on the web. And I think Gutenberg is important from another perspective as well, because it's 500 years, roughly, since he worked. And he totally changed things. Without his invention, I don't think we would have had the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution. All the things that happened in Europe happened because information became easy and cheap to distribute to a lot of people at the same time. And that totally changed Europe. And I think the web is the only thing that can be compared to the printing press. But unlike the printing press, the web is spreading all over the world. We see them in Indonesia and Vietnam and China. So I think the web has the potential to, to be a global change, just like the printing press changed, changed Europe. And I think also the timing is right. We had to look 500 years ahead. That's the... That's the the, the, the time frame, when we put out something there on the web, we should try to make sure that it will live there for 500 years, just like that Bible has survived for, for 500 years. So I look forward to the next 500 years, and I hope to see many of you there. <laughs> Thank you. Ich lade Sie ein zu Kommentaren, Fragen, Questions, Comments in Englisch oder auf Deutsch.
Bitte. My name is Jan Schallerberg. I work for a data protection agency in Germany, but I also am a researcher and funded by the Bell Foundation. I just made a conference this spring where we had Tim Barners-Lee uh, talking to us with Taco uh, on uh, decentralized social networking, and I'm very happy to, that we are uh, happy to, to, to see you here and see you present. There is a couple of questions, though, regarding to the relationship of a couple of technologies that you presented and privacy. One of them being the Opera technology with the compression of the pictures, and as you rightly said, that that helps a lot for, and I'm profiting from that all the time when I use my phone to, to access the internet. But of course, all the logs are generated with Opera. You are able to present us with these interesting insights, but you're also able to monitor my browsing behavior. Other aspect is the CSS technology that you just presented with the fonts which is an excellent technology, really allows us a lot of new uh, aspects and a lot of new things to make um, browsing more convenient. But at the same time, you're downloading the font just in time while you're browsing, and those people offering the fonts can then monitor your browser behavior. So how are you, how, what do you think about these aspects, and how do, how do we tackle these, actually? Okay, so th that's two, two good questions. Um, I may need a, um, a little help on the second one again, but the first is very clear to me. You're asking about the privacy, what happens when everything goes through Opera servers. Um, and that is a very good question because you, know, you can use, for example, your bank. You can, you can use that in Opera Mini and it will go through our service. And we had to decrypt that session because this is using S SSL, so it's only point to point and we cannot offer you know, from directly from the bank to the phone, since it goes through our service, we had to decrypt it there. So the, the data is in the clear inside our servers. And we're very open about this. We tell the world that's how it works. Um, you're going to have to trust us on that. Um, you know, we, just, we, just we would kill thing. ourselves. How many people do have a mobile browser on their phones here? How many people do you... How many people uh, did know that Opera was able to, to access that information in the room? It's a very knowledgeable crowd. <laughs> I don't is. think I don't think you most know, people... there is no transparency no. about that. You're you're not right in this. I think. I mean, you are open about we're, this. We're but very people, open about it. People yeah, are no, not but, aware no, of it. No, right? I mean, when you when you start using Opera Mini, we tell you you had to sort of say I I have accepted this. Of course, we know people don't always read this. Um, <laughs> but but uh, but you know. It would be our death if, we, if, if there was breach in our servers, uh, if somebody's bank account was stolen, or if we published data about personal users. We would never do that. I, we think it's fine to, to publish, to show people, you know, what's the top sites in Russia, or when is Libya down. We think that's valuable information to get out, but we, we, we'd be very conscious about it. Uh, we, we would never put things on a personal, on a personal level. Now, the second question about fonts, I didn't quite get, understand. Yeah. what you were well, getting well, at. My point wasn't very much a tech uh, opera because there is so many different entities. So yeah. I tried to give two examples. The other example is with uh, cascading style sheets. If you integrate fonts from different sites at just in time, then those entities providing those fonts, you just showed yeah. one font, um, will also be able to see who's accessing that oh, yeah, font. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're so, saying... So I'm, I'm more uh, aiming at, and the, at the generic or more general problem. I'm not saying Opera is bad. I mean, right. you're doing great yeah, 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 things, yeah. right? Well, you know, th that's kind of how the web works. Um, in a web page, you can include images from all sorts of sites. And when, when those images are fetched, that site can see that somebody fetches that image. Um, now, there is potentially a, a privacy issue there, but the site doesn't know who you are. So that's, that's for one, unless you've logged on and told them who you are. So I'd say that the risk is, is, is limited. I think it's manageable. I think the web has given us much more, um, much more on the plus side than on the, on, on the negative sides. And I haven't heard of anyone complaining about, you know, somebody saw which font I was using yet. But... But that could happen. You're right, and we should we shouldn't we shouldn't diminish it. We should think about these things every time we add something. We need to make sure that have we thought about how this can be abused. And I think, in general, my sense is that technologists do think about it, 
Um, for example, when you write the new standards, you always have to address security aspects of it. Now, sometimes you're not able to think ahead, and sometimes the combination of things makes it possible to do much worse things than those who, who, who invented it could foresee. But I think so far, the web... It benefits from there being a lot of community review before things go through. For example, the font thing has been in the making for years, and the, the specification has been reviewed. So I think many of these things are picked up before they get implemented in browsers. Noch Fragen, Kommente? Das ist gut, das trifft sich ganz gut. Wir sind damit ganz gut in der Zeit. Thank you very much. Uh, ich darf Sie jetzt zu einem kleinen Imbiss. Ich darf Sie zu einem kleinen Imbiss in der Cafeteria, die Treppe runter rechts, einladen. Und ab 12.30 Uhr starten dann die Sessions des Nachmittags. Vielen Dank.